1 Samuel chapter 5. And the Philistines took the ark of God. There was such a commotion. Eli's dead, his sons are dead, his daughter-in-law is dead. He has a grandson named Michabah. And brought it from Ebenezer, which means stone of help. And I read something that said today that they believe Ebenezer Scrooge of the Christmas Carol was, they believe, named this because, you know, he's supposed to be as a stone. And then later on, you know, he turned to help people. Well, the main way the Bible steps in, doesn't it? Onto Ashdod, and that's one of the cities in Philistine. And when the Philistines took the Ark of God, they brought it into the house of Dagon and set it by Dagon. Now, Dagon is a false god. And they got their own little church for Dagon, a little house. Dagon is your Friday god. See what you're talking about. Dagon means fish. Dagon is a man's head, chest. And the rest of him is a fish body with tail. He would be your mermaid, but not a woman, a man. And if you were to see Dagon's head looking like a fish, you would look at the Pope's miter on his head when he looks sideways as that would look like a fish with its mouth open. His body and is a fish and his head is a man? His head is a man and he has like a hat over over him which looks like a, um, what do you call it, a, a fish head. And I got a picture here real quick. I'm going to go see it. Bring it up over here. Oh no. That's up. And we'll computer seat. Your computer's in here, they just mess you up. Oh, you can show me again. Uh, here we go. I'm going to be using it for a title stuff. That's, that's what Dagon would look like. That would be his outfit. So Dagon, the Friday fish guy, and wears the imitation Pope's hat. He's a fish god. I wonder if this other symbol of the Philistines would have been the fish. But I wouldn't think it would say Jesus. So, and when they of Ashdod arose early in the morning, or tomorrow, everybody rises early in the Bible. Behold, Dagon was fallen upon his face to the earth before the ark of the Lord. So they open up the doors of Dagon and they step in and, hey, he's on the ground. Dagon, I don't know if he's wood or stone, I didn't check that. His statue, his image, his idol, it has fallen down before God, Jehovah. That was that. And they took Dagon and set him in his place again. So Dagon's a male god. I guess I don't know what the modern Bibles will do with that one either. Can't have male now. Now here is man in control of the god. They have to pick their god up. Their god's not going to get up. He's got knees, he's got feet, he's got hands, he's got fingers, he's got palms, and he cannot lift himself up. If they were left it, he would have been forever fallen down before the God of Israel. That tells you something. And when they rose early on the morrow, morning, behold, Dagon was fallen upon his face to the ground before the ark of the Lord again. And the head of Dagon... And both the palms of his hands were cut off upon the threshold. Only the stump of Dagon, Dagon was left to him. So they step in. Here's the body. It's on the ground again. He's headless. He's been decapitated. And his palms have come off. Now I have read today in commentaries of men who know the Bible say that that happened when it fell down. 
When the when that statue fell down again, the head pops off and the hands popped off. You didn't read the word, did you? It says specifically in verse 4, cut off. God drew his sword out and said, boing and boing. I've had it with you, Dagon. How dare you stand in front of me? Down, boy. And off goes his head. Goes his palms. That's an imitation of the Antichrist, the right hand and the right eye being, being uh, blotted out. But he loses his whole head. Cut off upon the threshold. That's where the door is. And only the stump of Dagon was left to him. So when you go to museums and you're looking around at the statue, you ever know there's a lot of statues of just a stump? I know there's one important one. I don't know who it is. I don't care what, what the name of But there's one, you know, he's got the head, he's got the chest, the stomach, but there's no arms and no legs. Dagon. Dagon. So what do you do with a fish? You flop him down the counter and you cut off his head. He ain't got hands. That defy evolution. So God cut it off. Therefore, neither the priest of Dagon. Oh, look at that. Dagon has priests. He has a house. He has a, a group of people. Neither did the priests of Dagon, nor any, anybody, that come into Dagon's house, tread upon the threshold of Dagon and ask them, you mean you're still going to worship this fallen god that has fallen down before the god of Israel and has chopped him in pieces before the god of Israel and you're still going to worship this headless guy now? I mean, it didn't say they put the head back on. It says they tread the threshold. That means to leap. Let's look at 1 Kings 18.26. They must have picked up a ritual. 1 Kings 18.26. Now this is Baal we're looking at now. 18.26. And mean old Elijah's having a contest. Between God of the Bible and Baal. And he says to the Baalites, get your offering, you go first. So 1826, and they took the bullock, which was given them, and they dressed it, and called on the name of Baal from morning unto noon, saying, Oh, Baal, hear us. But there was no voice, nor any answer. And they leaped upon the altar, which was made, leaping. But you can't always say in the Bible that leaping is bad, because when we go to 2 Samuel, chapter 6, verse 16, there's always an imitation of what God, 2 Samuel 6, 16, they are bringing the ark into Jerusalem. And David is so excited, he is so happy and rejoicing in God, 616 and as the ark of the lord came into the city of david michael and saul's daughter looked through a window and saw king david leaping and dancing before the lord and she despised him in his heart there's a leaping for god and, and rejoicing in god there's also a leaping for false gods I mean, there are loud voices, the Bible says, for God, you lift up your voice and you preach. And the devils had loud voices. They scream with a loud voice as, as Jesus commanded to come out of the bodies. So what they do is when they go into the house of Dagon, now they jump over the threshold. I don't know why. No one ever... You know, it's just another part of religion. It's another part of, of making up your own way of rules and testifying with no authority. Therefore, neither the priests of Dagon, nor any that come into Dagon's house, the loser, tread on the threshold of Dagon in Ashdod unto this day. But the hand of the Lord was heavy 
upon them in Ashdod. And he destroyed them and smote them with emeralds. Emeralds. That's a nice name for hemorrhoids. God gave them a pain in the butt. God's judgment upon the Philistine for Dagon being in front of the Ark of the Lord. I'll give you an anal problem. Now, I never had that, but I, I, I know people who had it, not very comfortable. And it's S, plural. Even Ashdog and the coasts thereof. So because of Dagon, they become a pain in the, you fill in the blank. Isn't it God? It's, God, what judgment are you going to choose? Uh, hemorrhoids. <laughs> That's a good one. And when the men of Ashdod saw that it was so, they said, The ark of God of Israel shall not abide with us, for his hand is sore upon us, and upon Dagon our God. So they know that Dagon fallen down. They know that Dagon, that he lost his head, lost his body. They know that these hemorrhoids are all from God. But they will not repent. They will keep Dagon. They're going to get rid of the Ark of the Lord. They're not going to do right. And this happens 2018. You go and you tell someone about Jesus Christ. You tell them about the saving grace of Jesus Christ. And they'll keep on going with their religion or whatever they believe. If anything and they sent therefore and gathered all the lords of the Philistines and there's five of them five cities five lords and unto them and said what shall we do with the ark of the God of Israel we got problems here and they answered let the ark of God I mean, yeah. Let the ark of God of Israel be carried about unto Gath. And they carried the ark of God of Israel about thither, about 10 miles south. They're carrying it. Going south. It was so that after they had carried it about, the hand of the Lord was against the city with a very great destruction again. And he smote the men of the city, the men of the city, both small and great. And they had hemorrhoids, hemorrhoids in their secret parts. And would look like not because God knows what a hiney is. It looks like not just where 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 uh, hemorrhoids and hemorrhoids are. It looks like it was in other places too. I don't know if that's possible. I didn't check that, but they got a problem. They've got a burning sensation. And they want to get rid of it. And the way to get rid of it is get rid of this God that's doing this to us. But not let's get right with God. You see, we're going to keep our religion. We're going to keep our science. We're not going to join the God of Israel. Can't do that. And I guarantee they have prayed to Dagon or they prayed to other gods of the priest and there has been no help. There's been no relief. Therefore they sent the Ark of God to Ekron. Alright, let's try the third city. And it came to pass as the Ark of God came to Ekron that the Ekronites cried out saying, They have brought about the Ark of God of Israel to us to slay us and our people. Listen, keep that thing out of here. We've heard about the troubles in Ashdod. We've heard about the problems. We don't want it here. Don't bring it here. It's going to kill us, slay us. So, see, a very great destruction. They said slay. God is not only giving them diseases, he's also killing them. And they sent and gathered together all the lords of Philistines again, the five of them, and said, Send away the ark 
of God of Israel. Get it out of here. And let it, remember Hosea 8, 6, it is not God. That's the box. Let it go again to his own place, Israel. That it slay, kill us not. And our people, Philistines. For there was a deadly, that's the first time that word shows up, deadly, in reference to the art, destruction. Throughout all the city, and there were two cities so far, trying to do the third. The hand of God was very heavy there. Listen, those pre, those magicians in Egypt said, listen, Pharaoh, this is the finger of God. The Philistines say, this is the hand of God. God is all powerful. God wiped out the gods of Egypt. For every one of them plagues was an ambassador of the of a god that was in Egypt. And here we have Dagon, the god representing of the uh, Philistines, and God is taking them out. And I don't want I don't want to get in much study of gods and stuff like that, but he's a fish god. What does hemorrhoids have to do with the fish god? I mean, you want to get in that? The Nile god. I forget, I forget the names of the god. He turned the Nile into blood and the fish died. They have a frog god. He brought the frogs in there and they just slime and googered everywhere. They had a lice god. The, the lice went and everybody and, and just defiled. They had a sun god and God turned out the lights. And gave them darkness. Complete darkness that they can feel. Here we got a fish god, Dagon, and he gives them emeralds. I don't know what the connection is there. And I, I don't want to study other gods. The Bible says don't even make mention of their names. But we're studying the Bible. So here's the hand of God. It was very heavy there. And the men that died. And the men that died. Death. Not were smitten with emeralds and the cry of the city went up to heaven <laughs> i don't know if they're crying to god or i don't know if they're crying to dagon but god hears it now this dagon this fish god is interesting because there is a representation of a fish that people think is Christian. And Jesus told the disciples, follow me, I'll make you fishers of men. That is no way a representation of a Christian. Because you're going to go out and get people who are fish. And you go out and get lost people. You don't go out and get saved people. So when we have a character, Job chapter 41... And fish, we have a character in the Bible, Job 41. We're going to see that Dagon is Satan. In Job 41, 1. In some places, my Bible says this is an elephant. We'll read this and see if you ever see an elephant like this. Hippopotamus, yeah. Can't, or some are crocodiles. Canst thou draw out Leviathan? There he is. That's our character. With a hook. What do you use hooks with? And his tongue with a cord, which thou lettest down, a, a cord that has a hook on it, and you drop it. Can thou put a hook into his nose? I've done that through fish. Or bore his jaw through with a thorn? You can take that line and push it through the, the gill and through the mouth and, and keep it on the stringer. Will he make supplications on today? Will he speak soft words on thee? This is the Leviathan. Will he make a covenant with thee? Will thou take him for a servant forever? Will thou play with him as with a bird? Will thou bind him for thy maidens? 
Shall the companions make a banquet of him? Fish meal? All you can eat fish? Shall they part him among the merchants where you sell the fish? Can thou fill his skin with barbed iron or his head with fish spears? Interesting. <laughs> Lay thy hand upon him. Remember the battle. Don't do it again. You're going to challenge the devil get in a fight? Remember how he kicked your butt and don't do it again. Do it no more. Behold, the hope of him is in vain. He ends up in the lake of fire. Shall not one be cast down even at the sight of him? It'd be like, you know, we ever, if God ever opened our eyes to see Satan. None is so fierce to dare stir him up. Who then is able to stand before me? That's God. You can't stand before this, this Leviathan. You can't stand before me, God. Uh, verse 13. Who can discover the face of his garment? Who can come to him with his double bridle? Who can open the doors of his face? His teeth are terrible roundabout. His scales are his pride shut up together as a close seal. One is so near to another that no air can come between them. He's watertight. They are joined one to they are joined one to another. They stick together that they cannot be sundered. Uh, down by verse thirty-three. Uh, wait, this is a, keep going. By his knee scenes, that's his breath. A light to shine, his eyes are like the eyelids of the morning. Out of his mouth goes burning lamps, and sparks of fire leap out. Out of his nostrils goes smoke, fire breathing dragon. As out of the seething pot or cauldron, you know, the smoke comes out of the pot. His breath kindled with coals, and a flame goes out of his mouth. His neck remains in strength, and sorrow is turned into joy before it. He makes your life miserable. He did that for Adam and Eve. The flakes of his flesh are joined together, scaled. They are firm in themselves. They cannot be moved. His heart is firm as a stone. Yeah, as hard as a piece of nether millstone. Very hard. When he rises up himself, the mighty are afraid. By reason of breaking, they purify themselves. The sword of him that layeth at him cannot hold. The spear, the dart, nor the habitant, no weapon. He is seen as iron and straw and brass as rock and wood. That's an elephant? They're, I mean, their elephants have been tied by irons at a circus. Darts are counted as stubble. He laughed at the shaking of a spear. Sharp stones are under him. He spreadeth sharp pointed things upon the mire. He maketh the deep to boil like a pot. He maketh the sea like a pot of ointment. He maketh a path to shine after him. One would think the deep to be hoary, white. Upon earth there is none. I mean, upon the earth there is not his life. Who is made without fear? He beholds all high things heavenly. He's a king over all the children of pride. That's Satan. Look at Isaiah 27 1. Isaiah 27 1. Something fishy. A little mermaid and little fish stories. And Isaiah 27 1 in that day the Lord with his yeah, with a sore and great and strong sword shall punish Leviathan there he is there he is let's see about this crocodile hippopotamus elephant the piercing serpent oh, you got the wrong how come people can't read their Bible a serpent is not an elephant of hippopotamus and crocodile 
even Leviathan, that crooked serpent, and he shall slay the dragon that's in the sea. So Revelation 12, 9 about this fish, God. Revelation 12, 9, the serpent, Leviathan. People can't read scripture with scripture anymore. I say today, I read today that that statue fell down and broke in pieces. Cut. And we'll see, we'll do Revelation 12, verse 9. And the great dragon, reptile, and brontosaurus, T Rex, or something like that, you know. That great dragon, he's a great dragon. The Bible says they're a dragon. Was cast out. You ready? Isaiah. That old serpent. That's not elephant. That's not hippopotamus. That's not a crocodile. Called the devil. I, now do we know who it is? And Satan. Which deceiveth the whole world. But we're not done yet. Revelation chapter 4. You got to watch out when you got a fish symbol. You got to make sure you got the, you know what you're talking about. You may, as a Christian, may put Satan on the rear end of your car. In Revelation chapter 4, verse 7. Revelation 4, 7. And the first beast was like a lion. That's the wild kingdom. The second beast, like a calf. That's your domesticated animal. Your cow, your dog. The third beast had a face as of a man, human beings. The fourth beast was like a flying eagle. Everything that's feathered and fall. Chicken, eagles, hawks, emus. And the four beasts, wait a minute, isn't there something missing in, that, in those classification of animals? Where's the reptilian class? That's the dragon. That is the dragon. So, if you've got a reptilian amphibian creature that is a serpent, that's also a leviathan, that is a dragon according to the Bible, and he referenced in Job to fish hooks and scales and a sea, and you got standing in a church or a building a god that represents the fish that is not anything to ever be christian i'm not saying the philistines ever try to be christian that's satanic and people don't realize when you got that fish and you think it's a representation of jesus christ paul says there's another jesus out there and you are carrying forth a fish that says Jesus, and you are proclaiming the Antichrist. Oh, where's that one? Oh, let me see if I can find that real quick in Revelation. Okay, chapter 13, verse 1. 13, 1. Now watch this. These are the beasts of the Antichrist in the tribulation period. And I stood upon the sand of the sea, and I saw a beast rise up out of the sea. There he is. He's a sea creature. Godzilla is coming out of the water to kill and to destroy. Satan is in charge of the waters. Because he's a reptilian, amphibian, animal kingdom. And fish and all that has nothing to do with Christianity. You know what I become when I get saved according to John chapter 10? Let's see, John chapter 10. I'll tell you what a Christian is. John chapter 10. We're not fish. Fish stink. I don't like fish. Yeah. Give me chicken. John chapter 10, 
And in verse 16, this is me. This is you if you're saved. And other sheep I have which are not of this fold. I'm a sheep. And he's my shepherd. No fish. All right, so if fish is a representation of, of Christian, John chapter 6. Watch where you get the big error. John chapter 6. Verse 9. Now you're going to run into trouble. I'm going to read verse 9. I'm going to ask you the question. There was a lad here which had five barley loaves and two small fishes. What did Jesus do with those fish? He gave to the people. And what did they do with that fish? They ate it. Are we supposed to eat Christians? No way is that Christian fish. It's a food source. And if there's any representation of that class of animals, it comes from Satan. Because we are sheep. So, Dagon, the fish god. I guess you had your meals on Friday. <laughs>